So, Paul, welcome back to the show. I know I took a few weeks off there. It's your prerogative. It's your show. It actually wasn't entirely my fault. My wife injured herself last week. Uh -huh. Real bad. She took, just going upstairs, she tore her leg muscle. Oh, wow. In her, in her calf. I don't know. She was like, oh, this muscle feels weird. Oh, my, my leg feels kind of tight. Like, oh, it's kind of swollen. I don't know. But she's been, you know, running a lot or not like running for exercise. I mean, like very active. Her job keeps her mm. on her feet a lot. And she just hurried up some stairs and she felt her leg like she felt something give in her leg and she collapsed. Oh, no. So she goes into the doctor and she just goes to the closest doctor. She's like an hour from home and she just goes to the closest like this clinic. Sure. Because you don't want to drive all the way back home to see your normal doctor. Right. And this doctor like was really put out by the fact that she wanted his help it was the weirdest thing like <laughs> did not listen to anything she said was dismissive of all the information you provide she provided and made declarative statements without like doing a proper examination like she talks about oh yeah my muscle i'm having this problem in my muscle my muscle my muscle gave way when i was going up the stairs and he's like all right we'll have an x-ray and I don't mind having an x-ray, like, as part of a battery of tests. Like, okay, you, you want to see, make sure there's nothing wrong with the bone, but then you're going to look at the muscle, right? <laughs> no, he never looked at it. He just, like, had... That, that was the one test he had ran, was something huh. that definitively did not apply to the problem she was complaining about. He had a he coupon buck for x-rays. He's got to use that up before it expires. Right? And then he prescribes her this boot. This boot to keep your muscle still or whatever. And he, like, just pokes her and she's like... Ah, she's in terrible pain. And he's like, doesn't seem to notice. And then just says, oh, yeah, you probably strained it. Here, um, here, put this, you know, get one of these boots. And um, it's this giant, like, robo boot. It's supposed to, like, keep your leg from moving. So she's, like, walking around with this incredibly heavy boot on her leg for a week. It is agonizing and exhausting. And every time she puts weight on it, um, it hurts terribly. Not so, helping, huh? Right. Okay, so th this is taking... I, it took me a while to set the stage. The person she works for, she's a nanny. The family she works for is a professional athlete. This guy is a, he's, well, in the past, he played for a major sports team and is a famous person, okay? Okay, enough said. And, yeah, they're extremely private, so she has to be, like, super careful. She's not allowed to tell anybody, like, who she works for. But this guy, of course, knows lots of doctors that are, you know, Good muscle at, injury <laughs> specialists or whatever. Exactly. You know, when your legs are worth millions of dollars, you know some good doctors. Sure. So he sends my wife to after a week of this and she's just in agony and she can't sleep and, you know, she'll like twitch slightly and wake up and like her leg is shaped weird. Like they, they are no longer symmetrical. The one that had the problem, the muscle is kind of riding low. Which indicates, you know, wow, what tore and how bad? And is that really going to heal on its own? Uh, so sh she goes to this doctor. And this doctor requests medical records from the previous doctor. Okay? And this previous doctor, the one that could not be bothered to look at her, had this long, detailed report about all these tests he ran that he absolutely did not fucking run. What? Yep claimed that he provided us with the medical boot when you know we had to go on amazon and buy that shit for ourselves um and wait for it to arrive like claimed he did all this stuff and ran all these tests no did none of those things like he just wanted to shove us out the door well he wanted to shove my wife out the door and this long detailed report about oh all the care he gave my wife and she's just like 
absolutely enraged. It turns out the boot was the opposite of the thing she should be doing. The last thing you want is a heavy thing on your leg. Oh, no. She needed an MRI, and she probably has a serious tear that might require surgery. And <sighs> everything that doctor had her do was just making everything worse. And, like, I'm worried that yeah. he's still, quote-unquote, practicing medicine out there. Probably, I figure he's probably like an insurance scammer. Like, you know, he just shoves you through his clinic and then bills your insurance for a million different things he didn't do. Yeah, that sounds like it's about right. So my wife has been injured real bad. And um, that's keeping things interesting around here. It It seems like you could report him to the insurance companies and the insurance companies would be highly incentivized to track him down and turn right? him upside down. Right. And I'm like, I don't even know. Is there a number you call? What do you do? Is there a thing that you're supposed to do? Like if he, he I don't know. Like on one hand, who has time? <laughs> on the other hand, well, what a jerk. Well, and, and what he's doing is actually illegal, right? Like it's, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. a regulated profession. So he has to perform his duties in a specified way and, and not lie about things. That's why he has to go to school for eight years or whatever. Right. Assuming he did that. Yeah. Well, you know, practicing without a license is also a punishable offense. So, so, um, yeah, that I've been, I've been, uh, I've been worried about my wife. I've been I've been very focused on my own health. You know, I was in the hospital a couple months ago, and now the last couple of weeks have been a kind of a shift in like, oh, who cares if I live or die? I just want my leg, my wife's leg to be okay. Oh, man. Well, I, I suppose you haven't been doing much game development then. No, I haven't been doing any. I barely... Oh, the whole point of that, I am sorry, the whole point of that giant wasting 15 minutes of your life on a dumb story about a jerk was to say, I have played very little in the way of games recently. And I've been busy doing other stuff. Um, but yes, I see here in the show notes, you're doing game dev? Please tell me. I've, I've wanted to do game dev. I've wanted to fire up Unity for days now. I'm like, oh man, I've got this idea. And I haven't had time. So let me live through you vicariously. What have you been up to? Well, this is like the, the merest shadow of game development, but uh, I got a commission to do a character and uh, some animations for the character. And then the guy who commissioned it is going to import him into Unity. And so I did this stuff, did a little animation, sent it off to him. And he gets into Unity and is like, it doesn't work. Here's a screenshot. And I was like, oh man, I'm this is going to take forever to troubleshoot via email and screenshots. Like I need to just install right. Unity. So I, it was the excuse I needed to finally get Unity installed on my computer. And yeah, I, I have I have complaints about Unity's native quota. I, I'm air quoting really hard here. Native support for Blender files, um, which every time I complain about it, people are like, why don't you just use native Blender files? It supports it natively now, Seamus. Oh, just use that. It's obviously the thing to do. And please... But tell me your problem. I'm I'm eager to hear this. So so the the problem that appeared was that and I made a little video about this. Uh, it's, it's on YouTube. If you guys want to go to my channel, that's the video and there's the post and my channel's there and there's a video on my channel there about Unity import from Blender. So I'll I'll do the the skinny, but the details are there. Uh, basically, there's a problem with the rig where the bones in the the way that I, I used Rigify, which is this automatic rigging system that gives you all the, the IK connections and all the bones and the helper bones right. and all that stuff. And it's really cool and really great, except that it creates this huge complex armature that then you don't really know what's going on inside under the hood. And so then when something goes wrong, you don't know exactly what happened. So uh, the problem was that some of the bones were stretching and in Unity, it's... Apparently Unity has like three different armature modes. I don't know if you've done anything with armatures in Unity. I don't even know what I've... Okay, I've wanted to make characters in Unity many times now. And I always get to the same thing. Okay, I made my mesh. I made my static 
This is like, you know, picture a little statue. It doesn't bend. It doesn't move. Now I want to animate it. How do I do that? Look up a, look up a tutorial. And it always begins with create an armature. And then it goes off into madness. And I've never gotten... So sitting here talking to you right now, I don't even remember what an armature is, except that it is <laughs> the beginning of the horribleness. Right. So armatures are basically the skeleton, if you think about it as the skeleton of a, of a character. Um, and they're even called bones. The individual pieces are called bones. But it's called an armature because when you're doing modeling, uh, like with clay or whatever, you make a wire frame first, and that wire frame is the armature. And then you can put the clay on the outside and kind of sculpt around it. So in CG, it's kind of the opposite, where you have this the sculpture first, and then you put the bones on the inside. Right. And that's how you're supposed to do wait, you're all supposed to your start, character animation. Wait, wait, you're supposed to start with the skeleton and then build up on top of that? Is that really no, no, like in real life? To... In, in in real life sculpture. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. I mean, you yes. can you can do it from the armature. There's actually called like an auto skin thing that you can just build a, an arbitrary armature and then hit the auto skin and it'll create this base mesh around all the bones and then you can sculpt on top of that using the sculpting tools. So that then all the weight painting is done properly and you don't have to worry about weight painting everything. Yeah, weight painting, for those who don't know, weight painting is when it like when you move when I move my arm, when I move my shoulder, um, like the stuff below my shoulder, you know, my bicep needs to move all the way, you know, according to how my shoulder is moving. Meanwhile, the stuff, you know, my my stuff up on my shoulder or on my neck should not move at all. But in between the two, as you go over the curve of your arm, there's stuff that, well, when you move your shoulder, this spot needs to move a little bit. And that's what waiting is for. It's to say, okay, when you bend this muscle or this joint, move this one all the way, but this one a little bit. And it gives you a little bit of, it really creates stretching across the surface mm. which might not be what you want or not but it generally is in <laughs> humans and and to my knowledge the biggest pain in the ass of modern of modern like um animation when you're making stuff for video games is the shoulder because your shoulder is the one joint in your body that radically changes shape based on its position yeah, like, I mean, all all the joints are bad. The elbows, uh, all the fingers right. are bad if you're doing like extreme finger movements. So you have to be careful about how you construct your mesh, and you have to be careful how you weight paint it. Um, Rigify does a pretty good job of just, and, and Blender in general does a pretty good job of just. You tell it like automatically generate all the bone groups, and then you just have to tweak it a little bit. You don't really have to change very much. Um, the other thing, oh, it, it knows that, you that you're do, making a human. It knows that you're no, making it, a human. Well, no, you you can make whatever armature structure you want, and then it'll basically it looks at the bones and what points are nearest to the bones, and then when it looks at the the joints, it looks it kind of blends them across the joints, uh, nice. blends the weight paints across the joints. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, cool. But you can in, so in Blender, we're now we're getting into the weeds. In Blender, you there's this add-on called called Rigify, and it was actually made by a guy that I met when I was working on Project London, and uh, it's you you make a base or you import a base mesh you tell it to like make a, a meta a meta armature and so it generates this armature the, it's not the armature you're going to using it's just like the the sketch of the armature basically and then you can move it around and change the proportions and change the bone locations and all that to fit your character or whatever it is that you're you're making and they've got one for humanoids they've got one for um like dogs and cats four-legged quadrupeds they've got one for birds with like the wings and all the feathers all rigged up and stuff uh I think they've got one for fish or something. But anyway, they've got a few base base armatures, and then you can add and delete bones. You can add a, a you know a third arm or whatever you want. And then when you you've got it all set, you tell it to generate the actual armature, and it generates a whole bunch of bones and a whole bunch of helper bones and a whole bunch of IK constraints and stretches and all that stuff, and generates a whole bunch of controls on the little control panels. You can change the weights from FK to IK. IK being inverse kinematics, where you set the target. And, I, and FK being forward kinematics, where you set the position of each bone, and that sets the, the position of the end bone. Uh, so anyway, it, it generates all that stuff. And one of the things it does is it generates stretch constraints that allow the bones to kind of stretch a little bit, because sometimes 
you need your character to look more cartoony and have their arms stretch a little bit or have them twist in a way that's not actually uh, physically accurate, but looks fine when you're doing animation. Right, like in your forearm, in real life, you've got two bones in there that cross over each other, but yeah. you don't actually model those two bones when you when you make a well, thing. You just I mean, have one bone that goes down the middle of the arm, and so that yeah. bone, but you know, you still have that wrist there at the end, and so you kind of need to pretend it's there, and stretching can help with stuff like that. And yeah, and, and Rigify actually does have multiple bones in the forearm to allow you to do the twisting so that it, it looks proper and, and gets painted on oh, properly nice. and all that. Yeah. Back I, in my day, I don't know we if had it does muscles, but back in my day, we had to do all this by hand, like painting. All right, yeah. here we are halfway off the shoulder. This will be like 50% strength shoulder move. Yeah. And you paint a few vertices with that and it was slow. And then, you know, you convert the model and then you open it up in, in the thing you're working on and you, and you have the model raise its arm and you're like, oh, that's horrible. Okay, no, back to the drawing board. Oh, uh, yeah, and the turnaround time is so slow. Right. Now, these days in Blender, you can put your your character in a pose, you know, set the, the armature to the pose position and then wait paint live so you can see the actual effects in the pose, the pose that you're in as you're nice. painting the, the weight paints. Yeah, T-posing wasn't even a thing when I was doing this. Oh man! And posing and, and now it's it's Y pose really because uh, usually they they have their arms kind of like down at an angle instead of straight out. That's A pose. The A pose, yeah. Yeah. Um, back in the day, it was just like you make it action figure pose where the arms are at the sides, and so you're like looking through this web of vertices, like through this oh, arm, no. through the hip, through the crotch, through the other hip to the other hand, and I like messing around with the and i realize oh this i'm grabbing the points on the left hand not the right hand because the two uh, are in the side view they're the same they're symmetrical oh it sucked it sucked everything back then sucked man yeah that's the other thing blender does it, it lets you do uh mirroring and then so you can weight paint just yeah. one half of it and automatically mirrors it to the the weights for the other side nice yeah i've derailed you sorry I, I got this whole thing working in Blender and I've got this little animation going and then I try to import it into Unity and uh, and it, the head is just like smeared out like it got hit with you know, 50 cal or something like it's just completely obliterated and so I'm trying to figure out so the first thing I do is I go to Google and I say Unity import Blender file armature rigify broken right or something like that right and I get this tutorial and it's like, okay, here's what you do. You take your, your, whatever your armature is and your character, and then you export it as an FBX because, and then you tell the FBX to only export the, uh, the deformed bones. So that way you don't have all the handles and all the helper bones and all that stuff. Just the bones that are actually changing the shape of the mesh. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And so I exported an FBX and imported it to Unity. It's still broken. So then I was like, oh no, like, what do I do now? And so now I'm messing around with the FBX and I figure out that I can like, I can fix the FBX file so that it's, it's corrected. Cause when I import the FBX into Blender, it's also broken. So I was like, okay, well, I, I guess it's, I guess it's a problem with the exporter or something. So I'm messing around with the FBX thing and, uh, nothing's working very well. I finally get it to work, but then all of my, all of my animation is all weirded out because I changed the shape of the bones. And so all the animation data is lost and. So I finally figure out that it was the stretch to constraint on some of the bones and the, the, the unity doesn't do the stretch to properly for whatever reason. And so then I start looking into the unity armature types and it turns out there's, there's three types currently, and who knows how many there used to be, but there's, um, legacy, there's what default and there's like character or something like that. And the character one has support for IK, which would be really nice if you wanted to do inverse kinematics where you're setting like, um, I think there's a number of games who, that use IK for feet so that you can just, the game can move the feet to the location under on the ground uh, dynamically so that the character's feet actually land on the ground instead of, you know, like, like clipping through the ground as you're running up a hill or whatever. Right. right. Like the, the, the notorious example of this is in urban areas when you have to step off a curb, cross the street, and then step up the other curb. You don't want to have to make yeah. bespoke curb stepping 
animations for getting on and off of sidewalks. You just want it to like solve that for you. But that turns out to be a huge pain in the ass. And if you've ever played like Grand Theft Auto 5 and like parked somebody halfway down a staircase, you'll see it's a little... Okay, I can see that's not how a, it looks plausible. That's not how a real person would stand on a staircase, but it looks physically, you know, you're not off balance. They've got one foot on each step or whatever. Right, right. Like you would turn your body so that both feet are on the same step or on adjacent steps. You wouldn't just casually like one, one leg two steps down from the other while you're in the middle of a conversation with somebody. So one leg's all stretched <laughs> right. out and the other one's propped up. And your upper body's level because, you know, you've got your leg bent and everything. But that looks like a funny pose. It looks like you're stretching out like you're about to go for a run. Right. So right. so Unity will, will do IK, um, but it only does it for the, for the, like the character model armature. And then it'll do bone stretching, but it'll only do it for the other kind of armature. And so you can't have both in the same armature for whatever reason. Like, it's baffling, but... I, I love this. is such a unity thing. It's like, okay, I want to have a character animation. And it's like, oh, what animation do I want to use? Legacy, default, or character? Like, plausibly, any of those three could be good. It's not like they're named <laughs> the old way... Or, oh, this is a universal that's like works on dogs and cats and forearm, you know, things with forearms. And this is just for you. No, the, the names give you no help. It's just all of them sound like the default choice. Yeah. All right. Would you look, would you like default, regular or normal? Uh, <laughs> uh... Yeah. So anyway, that's my story about unity rigs i don't know why they're so weird and i don't know why the native import from blender doesn't just work it seems like it could but it doesn't oh, it, it can it bring in blend files yeah natively and yeah yeah and and it it works now i just i default i defaulted um all the stretch stuff i turned all the stretch stuff off and now i can just import blend files the blend files that i made so that problem solved and i, I thank god because i don't want to be like troubleshooting fbx files all the time oh yeah but um, I complained about this during my most recent programming series where it's like when it does the conversion, it does 90% of the work, but then it doesn't, they use different coordinate systems. So in unity, uh, Y is up. If you move an object up, you're moving in positive Y direction and in mm -hmm. blender Z is up. So if you lift something in the air, the Z component is going up. Oh, I, I and, think they fixed that now. Oh, because back when I was doing it, they would just take the model and they would solve, they would quote unquote convert it by just turning it, flipping it sideways, which is like, you know, it looks correct. You get it in there and you're like, yep, it's standing, it's standing in the proper position. But then, you know, you're, somebody's playing the game and, you know, maybe they lose a round and you go to reset, reset everything back to its normal position. And of course you you take this imported model and put it in its default position and now it's laying on its back. Oh, oh, maybe they haven't fixed it then. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I imported it and looked yeah, right. Like, yeah. Like if you imagine a traffic light, it, you know, it will lift it up. Like if you do no conversion, then the traffic light will be laying on its back as if somebody walked up to it and pushed it over. But so unity <laughs> just wrote, instead of changing the coordinate systems, like you should, it just rotates it so that it's standing up, but it remembers right. that it's rotated. So now if you return it to its default position, boom, it got knocked over again. And you're like, wait, why is all this stuff knocked over? This is weird. What's going on? Yeah. It's like you did 90% of the work, but the easiest thing you didn't translate, you didn't change the coordinate system, which is super duper easy compared to all the other stuff you do during conversion. Yeah, yeah. It seems like it would be, well, I don't know. It's probably one of those other someone else's problem things where it's like, well, this is the job of the import thing. And well, no, this is the job of the guy who does the the coordinate, like the data storage, like vertex storage needs to do the conversion. Well, no, no, this is actually the job of the vertex data guy. Or this is the, you know, who knows right. whose job it is, right? And, everyone, and nobody wants to mess it up because then they've, you know, messed up native Blender imports and nobody wants that. And then if you probably, if you are using 
<laughs> oh no, if you're using native Blender import files already in your project, and then they push an update and you open it with a new version, now oh, no. all of the objects are rotated, but then the data is also rotated, so now everything's flipped over the other way. Oh, 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 nightmares. Unity seems to have this problem of solving all the problems 90% of the way and then moving on. Yeah, like it, well, it's an 80-20 thing, right? Like that last 20% yeah. is just real hard. Right, and they just like don't do that last little percent. Okay, if you're doing the default, if you just want to make a clicker game, we did that first, you know, 90% of it for you. But if you want like an animated character and not a stock one, well, then you're gonna, just going to have to do the whole thing yourself, by the entire process by hand, because our... 90% solution or our 80% solution will not work for you. Uh. Um, I want to give a shout out to somebody. Hmm. There, there is, um, this person emailed me ages ago. Uh, their, their handle on YouTube is gunmetal stug. And, um, they did an hour long retrospective on mass effect and really heavily refer this person bought my book. And used my book as a reference in making their video essay. Thank you, wow. Gunmetal Stug. Yeah. So it was very. But the the thing that this person did that I think is noteworthy is they did a lot of constructive criticism. How could you like I in my series I just concluded look you you broke the setting you burned it down it's broken you ruined it. You suck. This person makes a case that, <laughs> no, you could make more games. And they make a pretty good case for the specific series of decisions. You know, the what you would have to do to make more Mass Effect games and to have them work. Hmm. How to set something after the ending of Mass Effect 3. And I thought they had some very smart and reasonable suggestions. And so I will link to this video in the show notes. It, is, it hasn't even reached a thousand views as of this recording, and it deserves more. So please give this person some love. They put a lot of work and a lot of thought into it. And um, I'd like to see them get a little more attention. You could probably make your own video, plugging their video, and also your book. <laughs> right? All right. What do you say we do some mailbags? Oh, man. I was... I was kind of anticipating you were going to go off the rails there, but but no, mailbags are fine. Yeah, let's do that. The normal thing. Dear DieCast, have you guys noticed video games influencing movies more often these days? I'm not talking about the really obvious stuff like the new movie Free Guy. You know, when, when I read that first sentence, the Free Guy is the first thing that popped into my mind. <laughs> do you know about Free Guy? I don't. Free Guy? Free Guy is a, is a movie starring Ryan Reynolds. It's like imagine Grand Theft Auto Online where, where players are just running around the world shooting rocket launchers, wrecking cars, and causing just continuous chaos and shooting each other. Now imagine okay. you're an NPC in that world. So F Ryan Reynolds works at a bank. And of course this bank gets robbed every five minutes. <laughs> oh, no. and, and so it's just part of his day. Like he's sitting there, they're in the middle of a robbery and people are screaming and shooting guns and he's just on the floor talking about the weekend with the security guard. Like this is just right. their day. You you walk down the sidewalk, you're going to go get some lunch and, you know, cars just scream by in a running gun battle. Um, wow. Things exploding everywhere all the time. And I mean, the premise of Free Guy is that eventually Ryan Reynolds like breaks, even though he's an NPC, he breaks out of his programming and, and begins operating as if he was a player within this world. And, but he's still so like... It ends he, with him robbing his own bank or something? I don't know. I don't know where it goes. But it, you know, he still has the naivete of an NPC. So, hmm. like, you know, M NPCs are kind of simple-minded. They don't have a lot of life goals. Right. Um, I love, I, I don't know if the movie's any good, but my goodness, the trailers are hilarious and I love them. It, it helps if you're familiar with Grand Theft Auto Online. Anyway. Sure. Or, or any of those kind of uh, open world sandbox street level gun fight games. Right. But especially an online one. 
uh, just because the the one in this game is online, which adds mm. just a an extra layer of chaos to the whole thing. Okay, let me let me start this over. Have you guys noticed video games influence moving movies more often these days? I'm not talking about the really obvious stuff like the new movie Free Guy, but rather more structural things. I've heard multiple people refer to Mandalorian episodes as video game side quests. The one example that really sticks out to me is John Wick 3, where John and a co-op side character have to fight in wave defense combat against bad guys who take more bullets to be put down because they're wearing special armor. Any thoughts on this? Caden, is it that movies are actually being influenced by video games? Or is it that we play so many video games that we are projecting our video game understanding onto the movie? Hmm. Like, oh, th th this is a wave defense level. But I mean, it's like, it's not like there's never been wave defense in a movie before. Right. It's just, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't want to say Caden here is wrong. I'm just allowing for that possibility. Maybe, maybe we've changed and not the art. Right. The test would be to go back and watch some real old movies and see if they feel like they have video game tropes in them. Right. Oh, here's the, here's the, here's the wave defense. Oh, here's the adventure game thing where you've got to, you know, gather up a bunch of inventory puzzles. Right. Or Rambo movie, right? Like, oh, this guy's got infinite ammo mode on. Right. Or, or oh, it's time for a boss. You know, the, the hero opens up their yeah. stash of weapons and you're like, oh, boss fight time. Yes. I don't know. That's an interesting I, question. It's hard. It makes sense that it would be true because, of course, people making video, making movies also play video games. And we're now getting into the point where people raised on video games are becoming, you know, directors, stunt coordinators, directors of photography. They're, they're now in leadership positions and not just like key grip, whatever the key grip does or, you know, craft services. Like people that make creative decisions on movies are now old enough to have grown up on video games. And so it makes sense that that sort of thing will have crept into the type of art that they produce yeah yeah absolutely that and the people who make movies are aware of what their audiences are into and so if they're going to be speaking to their audience they're going to be speaking more and more to things about video games that the audience is aware of where they're appropriate hopefully right i mean there is the fundamental disconnect between the two where like a video game needs hours and hours and hours and hours of combat and a movie definitely does not need that <laughs> and would be right. tedious and horrendously expensive if like the Bourne movies had eight hours of jason Bourne just fighting mooks like he had to fight 400 mooks just to get into a building to have a cut scene where he talks to the next person who has a bunch of cryptic clues and is then is assassinated by a sniper just before they tell him the big secret. And so then he has to like walk across the street and fight his way through the next building. And that's two and a half hours of gunfights and kung fu fights before he gets to the top to fight the sniper. Well, and you're like, or even worse, where he where he dies like four or five times on the way to each objective oh, right. to restart yes. the scene over again. <laughs> Jason Bourne, keep, he finally gets to this big boss, you know, this is a really big, big looking dude. And the two of them are going to fight. And the guy kills Jason Bourne eight times before Jason Bourne realizes, <laughs> Oh wait, if I, instead of shooting him, if I shoot the support pillar in the ceiling crumbles and he crushes him. Right. You could probably make that almost as cheaply as a normal movie, right? You just don't do, don't cut any outtakes. You put all the outtakes in. Right. I mean, but they've even done that in movie form. Live, Die, Repeat or Edge of Tomorrow. Mm, yeah. As yeah. it was titled, you know, like a whole movie built around the premise of you die and you start over. It was a good but movie. It was eight hours though. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
movie needed to be eight hours long. But they did they did really sell you on how long Tom Cruise spent. Like you because they keep showing you a different slice of the same day, but they make it clear that they're showing you a different slice of the same day, you're able to extrapolate and realize, okay, it took you six hours to get here. And then you got T-boned and went off a cliff in a, you know, in a car crash. Game of, you know, start over. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, six. I mean, you know, I complain about the reset times in Dark Souls. But my goodness, Tom Cruise in, in Edge of Tomorrow, like, play for eight hours. And, you know, and he needs to try seven different. At one point, at the end of an eight-hour day of nothing but combat. He gets to this encounter and he can't figure out. And he says to the other character, my goodness, I've done everything I know how. This thing always kills you. And you realize, holy shit, how many times has he done this? <laughs> like, in the end of an eight-hour day, and he's done it multiple times. Like, a dozen right. times at bare minimum. Which, that's... That right there is a dozen days, not even including all the previous stuff he did. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. That's a that was a crazy movie. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah. All so right. so Caden, I think it's it's probably both. Uh, it's probably some just the audience is projecting video game stuff that they know about onto movies nowadays, but certainly videos and and movies are are aware of the video game space, so they're going to be speaking to that as well. Dear Diecast. So it finally happened. Truckkun came and whisked you away to another world. Limiting ourselves to video games, are there any particular worlds that you would prefer being reborn into? Bail, Tim. Thank you, Tim, as always. So even though the, the premise of this email was called Another World, the last place I'd want to go is the video game Another World. If you've ever <laughs> played that, that mid-90s no, game. Thanks. Uh, because that is very much a live diet. We were just talking about that, where you do it over and over and over again until you figure out how to live through it. Uh, that's what that game was like. It was super, super hard. Um, took a lot of, not hard, took a lot of trial and error. Yeah. It clearly, so what, I don't want to go there. Tim is referring to is the Isekai manga genre, where there's this some other world we have to survive there somehow and and uh usually or not usually but conventionally i guess the main character gets hit by a truck at the beginning of the show and dies and then it's like reincarnated somewhere else interesting i didn't know the cultural context for this and so my first thought was well it kind of depends on what i am in the other world like the first thing i thought of is i get to go to a video game world oh man send me to star wars be a Jedi Knight or, you know, Bounty Hunter would be so cool. But then I thought, well, hang on. Most people in the universe of Star Wars, I mean, statistically, the vast majority of people are not Bounty Hunters and Jedi Knights. Like, right. do I have any special... Is there anything that's going to make sure that I'm a main character? Because <laughs> if not, I don't want to go to Star Wars and be some friggin' moisture farmer. And have Tusken Raiders shooting at me all day. You could be a Tusken Raider, maybe. Right. Like, everything in Star Wars, if you're not a Jedi Knight or a bounty hunter, your life sucks. Yeah. That's really uh, true. So, if if you just, like, it, it depends. Do I get to be a main character or am I just a regular person? That is v you very much influences the answer to the question. If I have to be a regular person then I think the world of Spira in Final Fantasy X wouldn't be bad after Sin is defeated. Mm. Uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a tropical paradise. Nobody does any work. Nobody does any farming. Like, nobody has a job. Everybody just hangs out on the beach and plays friggin' Blitzball. Right. Uh, I, was, yeah, right I, I was thinking of which Final Fantasy game is the best one because they're all fairly paradisial other than the world destroying supervillain thing that's right. trying to destroy the world. Right. So Spiro wouldn't be bad after um after the the heroes bring the calm in Final Fantasy X. Minecraft wouldn't be bad. If you can survive the first two nights, you you can survive <laughs> forever. 
you know. And you've been training for that one. You're prepared. Right. Exactly. My goodness, I could do that in my sleep. And, then, you know, beginning of the day, day two, I will have a fortress and there will be there will be torches everywhere and we will be 100% safe. And by the end of day 10, we will live on an island where no monster could ever spawn. Hooray! Um, Mist might be a cool universe to exist in. The Mist books aren't like super dangerous. Like you can just exist in those worlds and, and as long as you're not directly like tangling with, what is it? Atreus and Akinar. The Dunny in general. Right. As long as you're not deliberately up in their business, you should have a fine time. Those those worlds are also kind of very serene, paradisial places. Mm, yeah. I was uh, approaching this a little bit more from the Isekai genre thing. So my first thought was Honey Pop. Oh, you know, I can see that. I mean, the Honey Pop is just this weird wor world where it's very easy to pick up women. And, you know, they'll, like, flirt with you rather than call the cops when you are a lecherous creep <laughs> towards them. Right. So, that's, like, even if seems you like don't want to hit I mean, if, if the world was constructed that way and, like, that was normal, then cool, I guess. Right, there's nothing compelling you to, like, walk around hitting on underage girls either. So, you could just live a normal life in that world and no problems. That's that's true, and of course that is what I would do. <clears throat> so, another thought was Shores of Hazaron, uh, which is this, like, MMO spaceship building colony thing. I, I think they may have taken it offline now, but if the graphics were better... Oh, no. See, this is, this is one of the questions. Like, your question was what's my place in society? And my question is, are the graphics levels in this other world actually the graphics levels in the video game, or are they like real life so that I can see what this game would look like if this graphics were good? Oh, right. Like, photorealistic Minecraft would be just super boring looking. Like that, Or, or maybe fantastical. We don't know. Right. It would probably just look like Rust. <laughs> or like, what's the, what's the other game? The, the the game where everybody just ganks each other all the time. Whatever that oh. game is. Daisy. Yeah, Daisy. So oh, if sh if like the graphics are upgraded to reality levels, Shores of Hazeron is a strong contender. If the graphic levels are actually what they are in the game, then maybe East Shade. Very pretty. Uh, again, and not super dangerous. Yeah, yeah, not not many hazards. Uh, they've got drugs that you can take and nobody really cares about them. Uh, and they apparently have no downside, so that's pretty cool. Um, and you get to paint and like walk around beautiful areas all the time. It doesn't seem to be too much work going on, so like that's that's a pretty sweet deal. Um, if you have to actually like have a world, see both of those. Well, I guess East Shade, you wouldn't have any technology. So if like if you couldn't live without computers, then uh, I think Quadrilateral or Cowboy is a, a strong a strong case. Oh yeah, very cyberpunky. It's kind of like '80s cyberpunk, as if if you could get like high tech stuff, but with like tape reels and right. things like that. That quadrilateral cowboy seems pretty sweet. But um, if you're just trying to go for like the all around, like living in some computer game forever, presumably, uh, I think I would have to give the trophy to Stardew Valley. It's got it all. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Stardew Valley. I should have thought. Animal Crossing would be another one that would be good. Just any of those very low-key, easygoing games. Not a lot of danger. Really, I mean, I think in Stardew Valley, aren't you immortal? Like, if you die, you just respawn in your bed? The, yeah, the villagers, ostensibly what happens is one of the other villagers finds you and carries you back to your house, and you're fine. Right, like, I, that's got, I, I, I feel embarrassed for not picking that. I was thinking, like, cyberpunk would be so cool. Just all those neon lights and flying cars. But, like, in cyberpunk, murder is is about as common as getting flipped off in traffic. Just people are always murdering each other and brain hacking each other and mind controlling each other. And there's always horrible things going down and the police are all corrupt. So, like, cyberpunk would be a cool place 
if they had like a tourist area that was safe for normies and you could hang out there and look out the window and go that's pretty cool but i'm not staying here i'm not yeah, waiting speaking around speaking of free somebody... guy right yeah oh yeah i'm not gonna wait for somebody to hack my brain and then use my body to rob a bank you know d drive the loot to their hideout drop the money off for them and then leave me standing there naked with the police converging on my position, believing that I'm the bank right. robber, which that's that's like dumbfounded. That, right. That That's what normally happens to you in in cyberpunk worlds. Just this continuous. Imagine if the way people treat each other on Twitter, if they could do that in real life with impunity. Oh, no. And speaking of nightmares right. now. Right, exactly. Dear Seamus, you previously discussed WandaVision on the podcast, so I was wondering what your thoughts on Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Loki, if you've seen them. Also, what if seems interesting? Dragon Age. Um, This person is named Dragon Age. They were not suggesting that Dragon Age is a Marvel show. That would be confusing. All right, so here's my rant on Falcon and the Winter Soldier. All right. For one thing, Loki was, I, I liked Loki, but it was sort of disposable. Like, I didn't care that much about Loki. It was interesting. At the very end, I won't spoil it, but they set up the next big Thanos level threat. We got to meet that guy who will evidently, you know, 12 movies from now, this will be the guy threatening to destroy the universe. You get to meet him at the end of Loki. Hmm. Um... And they're already telegraphing who he is and we're meeting him and getting to know him. That's fine. I don't think it needed to be that many episodes long, but it was cool. I really liked WandaVision. But Falcon and the Winter Soldier. All right. It, um, Avengers Endgame ended with Captain America giving the shield to Sam. If you remember, Sam is the Falcon. He's the guy that can fly. Like he has the bird wings that fold out of his back. Oh, I don't yeah. Know if you've seen. That. Yeah. Okay. And I was sold on this. In the movies, Sam is an earnest, honest, true blue. He, he's got the right personality. So as far as I was concerned, I'm like, okay, Sam is now Captain America. Great. I am fine with this. Going forward, he's the new Captain America. And then we find out in this mini series, no, he decided to not become Captain America. And I'm like, hmm. oh, it, it's it's like, you know, watching to the end of Spider-Man's origin story where he decides to fight crime. And then you go in to watch the movie and he's back to being a wrestler. And you're like, <laughs> but, but I thought you decided you were dedicating your life to fighting. Why are you doing this? Now I have to watch an arc where you decide to do the thing that you already decided to do. The premise of Falcon and the Winter Soldier is that, you know, Thanos killed half the universe and then half the universe got brought back. This created some problems, like, you know, with half of everybody dead, you know, there were all these free houses. Well, you know, you just go somewhere and pick a house and like, oh, the previous occupants all got snapped away. I live here now. It's fine. It's fine. But then everybody comes back and there's a bunch of awkwardness. Now it's like, well, who owns stuff and who lives where? And, oh, I was, you know, I, I went to this country. You know, people concentrated themselves when the population oh, went down. And now they need to spread out again. Well, of course that causes problems. Of course. There and are like people that suck. People's husbands yeah. and wives died and people got remarried and had kids together. And then it's like, oh, no, now my old person is back and I still love them, but they were dead and right. I love you too. And But my new wife is way younger and hotter and <laughs> we're having a good go of it. Um, so th it is understandable that there are difficulties that would be intractable. Now, Captain America needs to fight clear evil. He is a cartoonish character, right? He fights Nazis. They, like, there is no ambiguity. He's not like, well, maybe the good guys are actually the bad guy. No, he's Captain America. He is always the goodest of the good guys, right? Right. If he begins fighting you, it is destiny that it will be revealed that you were a secret Nazi. <laughs> you're, right? That's you're unavoidable. Cut him off in the parking right. lot. Turns out you were a Nazi all along. 
Right. You're like, oh, crap. I thought those meetings were a little weird. <laughs> I wondered what that was all about. <laughs> oh, I guess I should have seen this club. Coming. Right, exactly. It's like, but that's not a swastika. It's only got three arms. I'm sure it's fine. Anyway, but now we have this problem where it's like, oh, this is a real political problem. Some people, you know, have been displaced by all this chaos. And some people right. are unhappy about it. Yeah, yeah, and, a real socioeconomic problem that doesn't have a clear, good solution. Well, it does. It's that the people in charge are bad. And it's not clear how they're bad or what they should be doing. It's just Carly, this one character, is angry that she can't, like... It's not even clear what she's... She just thinks that there shouldn't be borders, right? Like, oh, I could come and go oh. and go wherever I wanted before everybody came back and now they're enforcing borders again it's like okay i can understand you're you're upset and maybe that's you know putting a damper on what you're trying to do. and so she starts murdering people and she starts murdering people from these government agencies that are in charge of providing relief and i'm like oh okay she's the horrible evil person no yep no we're Pretty supposed clear. to feel sorry for her and Sam is like, I understand, you know, you've got a right to be angry. I understand your cause that you're, but you know, I can't get with how you're doing it. And I'm like, yeah, it's, she's murdering people, innocent people. Like if we found out the post office was a front for the KKK, all right, you know, Captain America could go around and fight those leaders of the post office. But if somebody... <clears throat> Begins blowing up postal trucks and killing postal workers. I'm not going to go, well, you know, I guess I don't know who to, whose side am I on. It's hard to know. <laughs> I disagree with your methods. No, I disagree with your mission, too. <laughs> right, exactly. And the whole thing, he, like, refuses to fight her. At the end, she's, like, kicking his ass, and he refuses to fight back because he believes in her. And I'm like, you broke Captain America. You put him in a complex socio-economic situation up against a terrorist who use it, who has murder as her means of, of political change, and then you made him unable to figure out who the good guy is. I, was, I wasn't just, I didn't like the show. I was deeply offended by it. I was totally on board with Sam as the new Captain America, and now I hate his guts. I hate him. He's stupid, morally incompetent, like blind dipshit. The, it's the like, show... it's a weird, it's a weird double problem, right? Because they, they put the Captain America icon in this complex situation that doesn't have a clear good guy, bad guy. And then they made a clear good guy, bad guy. And then they made the bad guy, the good guy. Right? <laughs> Or, well, we, we can't agree with her methods. And it's like, okay, you can't agree with her methods. You still need to bring her in. She's murdering people. That's your friggin' job. That's something that Steve would have right. done. Like, oh, well, you have a good cause, but your methods are horrendous. Even though I agree with you, I'm going to bring you in and stop you. Because that's the right thing to do. Because innocence come before politics. And no, Sam can't figure that out. Which, in my mind, means he's unqualified to be Captain America. And um, there are so many social, actual, real life political comments that I want to make on this about like the justification right. that this is offering for things. But that's not this show. If, right. If you superimpose any real world debate onto this, instantly Sam becomes the biggest asshole on the planet. Um, regardless of your politics. Like, holy cow, what is wrong with this guy? How could you not see how important it is that you bring this person in? Right. Um, oh, man. So, and then at the end, he meets with these shadowy world leaders that are supposedly running this relief organization. And there's a five, min five minutes of screen time where he speechifies on how they need to do better. But because the show has been so vague on how it all works and like... Well, who's displaced and where does money come from? And like, what kind of help are you giving people? And who is it that still needs help? And why do they need help? And like, what are the mechanics of this problem? It doesn't want to talk about that. So, and that's fine. We don't need to get into the specifics. But then he's trying to explain his solution 
without getting into specifics. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> compassion and mercy. Right. Imagine somebody trying to explain to you how to solve the civil rights issue without ever mentioning race or where anybody came from or what or any specific government policies or anything that's going on or any current events uh well you are sometimes um ba bad you've done things that are not optimal and that i would like you to begin doing things differently well what do you want me to do differently just you know things in general <laughs> everything you do better right? <laughs> be a good person be a more good person <laughs> I know you're already like, a good person deep down, but you need to let that good person flourish. So I was so good. It was the one show that I really cared about. It was Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I was so on board because I love Captain America. Hmm. I didn't care about Captain America until the Marvel movies. I always thought it was weird. Like patriotism is like his character concept. And that was never, I was just, that didn't really resonate with me. But then I just like the guy who always does the right thing and just thinks the best of people and is just this naive optimist that the world doesn't mock him for being a dummy. You know, he thinks the best, hopes for the best. His bad guys are clear bad guys. Boy, I just love that whole vibe. And Falcon and the Winter Soldier messed all that up. And spoiler, mm -hmm. he doesn't even get the super soldier serum at the end. So he's not Captain America. He he doesn't have Captain America's superpowers. He just stays in shape and has a jetpack. Those are his powers. Captain America can can kick a pickup truck into you and knock you 20 feet away. Sam Wilson can't do that. <laughs> and also can't bring in the bad guy apparently. Right. I can't figure out who the bad guy is, even if one side is is being a terrorist. So yeah, uh, the heck with Sam Wilson. I'm so well angry now. I'm angry, angry too. I'm glad we could come together over this. Finally, something that brings us all together. Now you can defend Sam. I've seen people do it, but you have to do it by bringing in other context. Oh, you see, within the show, it's this you know code for this other social issue, and it's like. Yeah, you have to superimpose some other story onto this one for it to make sense. <laughs> well, and, and even then, I would argue that, I mean, that's what I've been doing. That's what my brain's been doing this whole time. It's like, oh, I right. see what they're trying to say here. But even then, I don't agree with their conclusion or their, or their, any of it. Like, that's, right. that's why we disagree on this issue is because you think that it's really clear. And if you map it onto this other way, it's, it's like, oh, well, of course. This other thing is right and this other thing is wrong because see we made a movie about it and like isn't it clear now? It's like no, it's not clear. You're you're being a dummy and your plan is stupid. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I am offended at the new Falcon and the Winter Soldier and deeply saddened that my favorite superhero is now a dumb dumb who doesn't know right from wrong. Um I saw oh, oh, but the happy ending is I saw what if the, the the first episode just dropped and it's um oh it's such a brilliant premise it just takes the premise of like i mean th this was a real series of comic books that would ask you know what if flash thompson's the one that got bit by the radioactive spider instead of peter parker and then it would tell the story of like flash thompson having to learn how to not be i don't know if this was ever done but like or like gwen stacy or somebody and it'll be like oh flash thompson had to learn not to be such a bully and he went through a similar arc to get to the heroic Spider-Man persona. But, you know, he got there in a different way because he started out as a bully instead of a victim of bullying. And mm, that's, you know, right. Where, you know, you tell all these interesting things and it doesn't matter. You don't have to make the canon line up. You just tell a good story and move on. I love it. The very first one asks, what if just before they created Captain America and, you know, injected Steve Rogers with the blue science juice? Um, the something went wrong. There's an explosion. The bad guys attacked, and it was Agent Carter, his love interest, that wound up jumping into the machine. And she comes out, and I thought they would just like make her look the same. No, they did to her what they did to Steve Rogers. So when she pops out of the machine, 
this is done in, in cartoon style, by the way, which I also love. It is just so hmm. cool. I, I it, it just fits the material so well. Is that Haley Atwell's character, Agent Carter, you know, uh, Steve's love interest, is now like six and a half feet tall, and she looks like an <laughs> Olympic gymnast. And nice. she... Oh, it was so awesome. And she gets the shield, except they paint the Union Jack on it instead of the Stars and Stripes. And she fights more or less for for Britain. And she becomes Captain Carter instead of Captain America. And it mirrors a lot of um, Steve's story beats. She still has to face the Red Skull, and she, but it's all different. It's just this t giant remix. Mm. Right, it's like Captain America remix featuring Skrillex. You know, it's. <laughs> I loved it, and it looked so good. I, it looked um, the the animation style they use really sold the hell out of all the heroic stuff. Like, man, I want to see regular Captain America rendered in this style, just because you can do crazy things with the shield and you can make the movements look. You know, animation it. You'd like in uh, anime, you can you can play around with time, and if somebody does something really fast, you don't have to show the intervening frames. You can just go from them standing still to them being in the uppercut position and the other person being launched in the air with no intervening in frames. Motion. Right. In so, yeah, in slow motion. Um. In live action, that would look stupid. It would look like a mistake. It would look like something went wrong in the editing booth. And in animation, it just looks astounding. And seeing like half an hour of Captain Carter bash crap with her shield was just so fun. I loved it so much. Yeah, I'm looking at some and they're screenshots gonna do of this and it's very, it's, it's stylized, but it's not very stylized. It's very realistic looking. Right. I think there's some rotoscoping going, or I think actually it's um, mocap line art over 3D models. Yeah, well, probably it's yeah, probably it's stylized rendered of 3D models, and they probably did some mocap with the animators or the with the uh, the actors and actresses. And I just love that they did for Captain Carter that she's like really ripped and buff, and they didn't just make her this magically this petite little thing that is as strong like she actually like um if you wanted to um do a live everybody's like they should do this in live action and i'm like if they do this in live action they gotta hire gina carrera or whatever her name is from the mandalorian to play captain carter and i don't think she can do a british accent <laughs> uh, she's like some M mma fighter and she's like six feet tall and she's got like her arms are bigger than my legs she is just absolutely badass and that's what captain carter looked like and it made me so happy that they really like went there instead of oh but we want her to be cute no captain carter is not your waifu exactly exactly <laughs> captain america or captain carter is not your waifu that's it this is like oh when she steps out of the machine and she's like six and a half feet tall and everybody's like looking up at her and i'm like that's so cool um oh wow we're run, we've run long well and we didn't even get to the i was worried we didn't have enough show this week and we've actually run long and you predicted it you predicted at the beginning of the show i was like we don't have enough show here and you're like we always run over yeah we're well we we psych ourselves out because we're like oh we don't have enough show we'll just talk a lot about whatever things we have to talk about and then we end up talking a lot i could have saved the creepy doctor rant we didn't need that um so we're going to save this email for next week. Uh, wow, these were good questions. These were fun questions. Yeah. So Marvin, don't worry. We'll get to your question. I mean, your your novel. I mean, your book, your multi-series uh, <laughs> epic. Right. Your treatise on difficulty in games. We will get to it. Um, yeah, so thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Next week, we'll do better and try and answer more questions, and I won't let Paul talk so dang much. I'm sorry, he gets out of hand sometimes, you know. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. I thought I actually did talk a lot this week. It was oh, there you go again. I don't know what got into me. I, I'm just rambling on, on and on. 
Somebody stop me. Stop me!